Now, we do know that there are aerosols in the atmosphere just because we have our transmission spectrum. But out here, could that in fact be a reflection signature? So could those quartz clouds uh, that we knew were on the limb be on the day side of the planet as well, causing some reflection? But it could also actually be us looking into the deep interior of this planet. Um, WASP-17b, again, is super inflated. It's actually on a retrograde orbit. And so it's had a really crazy orbital evolution history. It's likely that it has a significant uh, intrinsic temperature as well. And so this is something that we continue to uh, try to figure out how best to uh, differentiate those two options. All right. So again, we spent 70 hours, but we were able to finally make those plots that we, those predictive plots I showed you at the beginning uh, become a reality. So transmission and emission spectra. And we're gonna do a lot of wonderful work with combining those two spectra to try to under the th understand the three dimensional nature of the planet, but also just using the fact that these data are incredibly high precision uh, to do things like transmission and eclipse mapping. All right, and in my last few here, I'm just gonna talk about the other parts of our program. And that's uh, HAT P26b was our Neptune target. And we're gonna call this our prototypical warm Neptune. And for this, again, we got transmission and emission observations, uh, transmission covering 0.6 out to 14 microns with emission, we focused more on the three to 14 micron range, again, because this planet is only a thousand Kelvin. And so we didn't expect there to be much signal for a short word of, of three microns. All right. And why we care about HAT P26b, um, as discussed earlier, we often wanna try to understand the mass metallicity relationship that we see here in the solar system and what that means about um, planet formation. HAT P26b sits at a very um, important part in this diagram. It is again, about the size of Neptune. Um, previous observations using Hubble had put it as having a, a sort of a solar type metallicity, which was really contrary to what we would expect for a planet like this. Here are the previous observations that we had for HAT P26b, which is the basis for that uh, sort of solar type metallicity. Again, all we had was HST, uh, Whitefield Camber 3 probing those water features and then the two Spitzer points out at the longer wavelengths. And this is what we have now. So I don't have a beautiful review. These are sort of hot off the presses, but we are seeing tons of features in, this, in the transmission spectrum for HAT P26b. We're seeing hints of methane, um, strong water features, we're seeing a very, very prominent uh, sulfur dioxide bump, as well as a carbon dioxide bump, which gives us a very strong constraint on the metallicity of HAT P26b, which does need to be revisited from our earlier predictions from uh, Hubble. Looking at the emission spectrum of HAT P26b, now maybe not as beautiful, it was kind of hard to dig the signal out. I wanna emphasize that we were getting down to signals of about 50 parts per million in order to measure the emission from this planet. And what we're finding, is that uh, from our emission spectrum, we again are seeing sort of the same sorts of features from water and then metallicity on the day side that's consistent with something like 20 times solar. We have, what I have on there as well is the previous Spitzer observations. Spitzer used four eclipses in each of those channels to get roughly the same amount of precision that we're getting with one single eclipse with near spec. And so I want to just emphasize what a giant leap forward this is for us. The eclipse timings actually are really important for HAT P26b. This planet is on an eccentric orbit. Um, it has an orbital eccentricity of about 0.15. Um, and previously we've not been able to constrain that or its argument is pericenter without really uh, strong constraints on the eclipse timing. All right. And so what I do wanna emphasize is that when we have surveys like this, um, where we're going deep into planets like WAS-17b with all of the transits and eclipses, both with Hubble and JWST, and then HAT-26 as well, we can combine that with um, the observations that were taken of WAS-39b during the ERS program, which did uh, just near IR and mid IR transits, plus uh, the UV coverage as well. And what we start to see is a trend emerging, especially in the sort of three to five micron region. And so what we've done here is sort of plotted a normalized transit depth versus wavelength for both WAS-17, HAT-26, and WAS-39, and the spectra are incredibly similar. So even though these planets are at different temperatures and also different sizes, we're seeing those strong signatures from carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. It tells us a lot about the planet's formation, formation but also the photochemistry affecting their atmosphere. 
All right, and then I'm only going to briefly touch on this one. Um, and people can feel free to talk to me later about it. Um, our TRAPPIST 1E observations, uh, again, we're trying to see if this planet has an atmosphere. And so we did four transit observations of TRAPPIST 1E, which were very successful over the span of this past summer. Um, beautiful, you, our beautiful white light curves I'm showing here, incredible precision that we're getting using the near spec PRISM instrument. Um, I do want to highlight, in fact, that the last transit we got in October is slightly offset from the other three. And that's due to the transit timing variations that are known to occur in the system. And it's how we can actually constrain the mass of these planets even better. So talk to me later about this, but all I can say is, is we're seeing something that's not flat. All right, so I just wanna end here um, and just put forward, this is the philosophy which with we approach this program to studying uh, transiting exoplanet atmospheres with JWST. Um, I think there's a place for all sorts of uh, programs, but we're really hoping that we're gonna be able to leverage this data, not just to make these awesome spectra, but also to make three-dimensional maps of these planets as well. Thank you.